Jay Powell is at war again with the bond market. The truce didn't last all that long, of course. If you think about last month, the FOMC got together, and when they paused the rate hikes, you could almost sense how policymakers had become somewhat content with the way everything was moving. Consumer price pressures were coming down, the economy seemed to be holding up well, and while they wouldn't say that the soft landing was their base case, in fact, it said it wasn't, it was still enough of a plausible outcome that another pause, another data-dependent month where we could sit back and wait and see if the figures come in in the way that the officials really want them to. But then suddenly, over the last week or so, central banker after central, Fed official after Fed official, Jay Powell himself comes out and says, oh no, we're not done. We're, we're back to being hawks all over again. What changed between last month's dovish pause and this month suddenly we don't know what's going on in inflation. To give you a sense of what I'm talking about, here's what Powell said just last week. He said, we are not confident that rates are high enough. If it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do so. We will continue to move carefully, however, allowing us to address both the risk of being misled by a few good months of data and the risk of over tightening. So were they being misled by a few months of data last month when they paused and now all of a sudden they're back into rate hikes? What is it that changed? What changed is quite simply bond yields. Before the meeting last month, as you probably are aware, long-term interest rates in the United States, around the rest of the world, they had been rising. And that's the one thing that policymakers have been at war with ever since last year when bond yields stopped rising and started, the curves inverted, yields started to go modestly lower, but they didn't go anywhere near as high as policymakers wanted them to. And so over the last year, interrupted by that little banking panic thing in the middle, the FOMC, the ECB, all of the central banks, even the Bank of Japan to an extent, have been at war with bonds. They want yields to go up. And in September, yields did go up only until the middle of October. So right around the time the FOMC got together, they said, well, rates seem to be going in the right direction. We'll, we'll pause. Now rates are moving lower again. Suddenly, the Fed is back to its hawkish ways. And it really raises a number of thorny questions, starting with the, the behavior of interest rates themselves. What is the, the bond market is actually doing? And that's really quite simple. Bond yields are, in the absence of an immediate threat, yields are going to go to where short-term rates are. They're going to go to where the Fed is. If there is no reason to be inverted, for example, the curve will not be inverted. So during these short run periods where it seems like there aren't any immediate threats, such as the interim between when the banking crisis happened in March, April, and May, and then over the summertime, rates drifted higher. But if there's a threat, what happens? As we saw in March, April, and May, interest rates start to go down regardless of Federal Reserve policy and policy rhetoric. Rates act independently when there is an immediate threat to the banking system, the monetary system, the economy. To policymakers, they always come back to this idea of inflation, that they have to control the economy in order to control inflation. And in order to control the economy, they have to sell you on this idea that higher rates are the way to do so, especially in the inflationary case. And of course, the obvious, the op opposite case is when the economy is bad, they need to lower rates. But if the bond market is lowering rates when the Fed is trying to raise rates, the Fed can't sell you on the, the idea of controlling inflation, the economy, or anything if they can't even control interest rates. So the Fed is at war with bonds, and they have made up a whole host of reasons why that might be. But essentially, it boils down to that one narrative. If you haven't seen it yet, I just did an interview with Mr. Mike Green himself. We talked about all, quite a lot of things, but mostly focused on the stock market. Some very interesting developments, perhaps a revolution in retirement plans just announced by IBM. Get Mike's thoughts on that, what's going on in the stock market, short run and long run. Part of that interview you can see here on the Eurodollar University YouTube channel. It's one I just released Sunday, so that would have been November 12th, very recently. The rest of that video is available to Eurodollar University members as well as our DDA or Deep Dive Analysis subscribers. If you are one of those, 
check out the Eurodollar University member site or the research subscription site and you get the rest of the, you get the entire video with Mike Green along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Eurodollar University members, we've got massive amounts of content talking about what the Eurodollar system is. Deep dive analysis subscribers, that's where we dive deep into the current conditions in the Eurodollar system and try to make sense of what they are from the perspective of the Eurodollar system. So a whole bunch more than the Mike Green interview, but... The Mike Green interview is worth your time and effort anyway. So check that out at the Eurodollar University website, which is conveniently eurodollar.university. This entire debate on inflation, doves, hawks, all of it, comes down to one central issue. And that issue is the one thing that you'll never, ever hear policymakers talk about. Money. The monetary system. Think back in all of the discussions that they've had, that we've had, everything. The topic of money never, ever comes up. And that is by design. Because the Fed has no idea what's going on in the monetary system. And because they have no idea what's going on in the monetary system, they have to sell you on a different measure, different set of controls. They've had to invent an entire different way of thinking about inflation than money in order to be able to sell you that idea on controlling. And that is a simple relationship between consumer prices and the economy, the Phillips curve. They also add something about expectations, but a lot of it is derived from this supposed trade-off between low unemployment and high levels of inflation. And if you can control the level of unemployment, then you can thereby control inflation, assuming that's a solid relationship. And if you can control the level of unemployment through interest rates by making rates go higher, then you have to demonstrate that you can control interest rates by making all interest rates go higher and stay that way. So the Fed has to sell you on this idea of control. They control interest rates and therefore interest rates control the employment market. And the employment market is directly and inversely related to consumer price pressures. Therefore, raise rates, inflation goes down through the labor market. All nice and simple. And it all goes back to A.W. Phillips and the Phillips curve. But the problem with using the Phillips curve should have been apparent from the very beginning. And that is the association between, say, wages, as Phillips was measuring, and consumer prices wasn't all that solid to begin with. It was more of a tenuous relationship, hardly the kind of thing that you would put together as Samuelson and Sola did in the early 1960s, as some means to exploit and to introduce control over the entire economy. I just raise rates and look at that, consumer prices go down. I just lower rates and look at that, unemployment goes down and the economy responds positively. That's the narrative that they're selling you. But it doesn't ever work that way. More than that, worse than that, it has never really worked that way. Just putting together simple scatter plot diagrams on the relationship between consumer prices, or however you want to measure them, and demand for labor, however you want to measure that, what you come up with is basically no association or very little association, certainly not the level of degree of control or the degree of precision of which you could exercise control over the economy. So let's, let's, let's do that. Let's put together the data because nobody ever checks these assumptions. You always hear them repeated throughout financial media, throughout polit politics, politicians everywhere. Everyone just repeats this idea that inflation is a trade-off for unemployment and that the Fed can control unemployment through raising and lowering interest rates. It's all so neat and simple in theory. But how does it work out in practice? Well, it doesn't work out well at all. So let's just do, let's start out with the great inflation. I mean, the great inflation should have been, it's in the name, it should have been the most robust demonstration of the relationship between unemployment and consumer prices. After all, you continue to hear this today, that somehow the Phillips curve was involved in the great inflation and therefore the unemployment rate, the trade-off, all of that stuff, it should have been most obvious and evident in the 1960s and 1970s. So the 17 year period between 1965 and 1982, what you see is basically no relationship whatsoever. It's almost completely random. And that's not surprising to those who've paid attention to the economic history of the last 50 years, even longer than that. But essentially, 
as Milton Friedman pointed out at the time, there was no relation. We should not expect this exploitable Phillips curve relationship. Instead, as Friedman said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So it doesn't matter what the employment rate is, except in short run conditions. If the banking system is cranking out new forms of money and new forms of credit and expanding, not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively, also all across the world, that's the inflation not the unemployment rate, not the Phillips curve. So how about the flip side? Let's go to the great so-called moderation. So between 1990 or really 1991, after the 1991 recession was over with the SNL recession. So between 1991 and 2023, what do we see? Well, you kind of see the general relationship with the Phillips curve where as the unemployment rate goes down, consumer prices do tend to rise. But once again, it's more random and scattered. It's a really scattered, scattered plot. Then there is a solid, predictable relationship. In fact, you look at the regression numbers and there's really not much association there at all. But if we break down by periods, let's, let's start with, let's break it down from 2007 and 2008. So the real great moderation, let's just focus on that one. So between 1991 and 2007, there's even less of a relationship there. In fact, it's almost completely random, just like in the 1970s. No, no, no correlation between unemployment rates and consumer price numbers here using the PCE deflator. Um, and then afterwards, the Great Recession, the great quote-unquote recession, the period of disinflation. Well, once again, you don't see much of a don't see much of a resemblance there and much of a correlation there. There is somewhat of a relationship. You can see there tends to be um, higher unemployment rates, lower consumer price numbers, PC deflator, CPI doesn't really matter. And lower unemployment rates, there is some, some plots, some months where there is higher levels of consumer prices, but yet again, there is no consistency. There certainly isn't a dependable relationship in which you could claim to exercise control. So what economists have done is come up with this idea of a flat Phillips curve. And I talked about the flat Phillips curve in a previous video where they said, okay, the Phillips curve, maybe it doesn't matter, not all that much. Maybe it is just a random relationship, except in the most extreme cases. In extreme cases, they defined in a recent paper, the paper I was talking about in that video, as when the U.S. economy in particular experiences a labor shortage. When the unemployment rate gets really low, or in that case, they defined it as, oh boy, using job openings from jolts. When the job openings rate goes way up or the unemployment rate goes way down, there's a shortage of workers. Maybe that accounts for why consumer prices have changed in the face of a labor shortage. Only the labor shortage. Throw out the rest of the Phillips curve. What about just in this extreme case of a flat Phillips curve where you see non-linearities, basically labor shortage, there's your consumer prices. The competition for workers really heats up to an extreme, and that accounts for what companies are doing with consumer prices. Well, if that was the case, then what we would see, it would be the opposite of what we do see in the, again, relationship. You can use the, the jolts, J, jolts job opening numbers if you want. I'm going to stick with the unemployment rate here because it doesn't matter. But that's what I've been using all along. Um, JOLTS only goes back to 2001. The unemployment rate obviously goes back a hell of a lot further. In the 2020 to 2023 period, once again, we see what looks like the Phillips curve at first, where you have high level of unemployment, and then you have a low level of consumer price increases. Then as the unemployment rate starts to go down, the level of consumer prices starts to go up and it looks a lot like the Phillips curve. But it only looks like the Phillips curve up until around February of 2022. Suddenly, this relationship that's supposed to be, even if we consider a flat Phillips curve, just disappears entirely. Because remember what the Phillips, the flat Phillips curve is. The fat, flat Phillips curve says it only really matters when the labor market gets into its real serious shortage situation, when the unemployment rate is really low, say at a 50 year or close to 50 year low or more than 50 year low, or the job openings rate surges way high. And that was 2022 for the most part. You see the unemployment rate get down to its 50 year low, over 50 year low, and yet 
you've got consumer price numbers that are basically all over the place. And what you see again is where there's supposed to be this meaningful relationship, instead, there's just randomness. Over the last year and a half, the unemployment rate has stayed in this labor shortage type situation as defined by these economists, and yet consumer price numbers have gone down regardless, which is maybe the opposite of what's supposed to happen, at least according to the flat Phillips curve. So all of this idea that the Phillips curve somehow explains consumer prices is in every single instance, including the latest one, this flat Phillips curve instance, there is no evidence for it whatsoever. And I'm including, we're just talking about some simple scatter plots here. You can get more complicated and go into ex, uh, uh, Phillips curves that are redefined by expectations functions as a lot of econometric studies have gone to. It doesn't really matter. What you end up with is very little, if any, relationship, and certainly not the one that most people are looking for, or most economists are looking for, to help them explain how they can control consumer prices. Because that's what this is really all about. They want to tell you that by raising interest rates, that will lower the level of employment, raise unemployment, therefore, as a trade-off, it will reduce consumer prices. That's what the Phillips curve has proposed. And from the very beginning, the Phillips curve has had no evidence that there is even, there is even a relationship here to exploit, let alone the Fed's ability to control the economy. But that's really what all of this is about. It's about selling this narrative that the Fed can control consumer prices through exploiting interest rates, which then leads to an effect on employment, which then causes consumer prices to either raise or lower depending upon what these geniuses in Washington are doing. But if the Fed can't even control interest rates, then none of this actually matters. Well, none of it actually matters to begin with because thinking about this in the right order, this whole Phillips curve thing is meant as nothing more than this interest rate signaling policy to give it some some legitimacy, or at least make it sound like it's legitimate, like there is some economic basis to pay so much attention to interest rates to begin with. So if the Fed can control interest rates and it can get people to believe that this Phillips curve thing is real, then maybe you will become the Phillips curve. If you act in the way the Fed, was, Fed wants you to, then maybe if it raises rates, you cut back on your own activity. Suddenly, employment goes down. Therefore, maybe consumer prices pressures do reduce. Do recruit, consumer price pressures do decline. And maybe it all just works out for the best. But it can't work out for the best unless that first step in the process, controlling interest rates, actually happens. So the Fed has been trying desperately to talk up interest rates to get bond yields to go up to at least begin the process of selling their control narrative. The conversation I had with Mike Green, at least the first part of it, that's the video I've got linked below me. That's the part we put up on YouTube. The full interview, the full conversation, that's available to Eurodollar University members and Eurodollar University DDA subscribers. And if you are a Eurodollar University member or a DDA subscriber, I cannot thank you enough for your support. And until next time, everyone take care.